and that's come to church. And uh, you should never send your children to church. You should always take them. And uh, that's always a good thing. I, I, I had a conversation with somebody here a few years back, and uh, the, the conversation was about why are you down here at the baseball field when you should be here? And, uh, and then the first answer came, well, we signed up. <laughs> yeah, okay, so why did you sign up? I'll just keep asking the questions. Well, the whole thing was, the whole thing was kind of around, this is important for him to do, this is very important for him to be a part of, that I went through all this stuff. It's like, yeah, but here's the problem. The lesson you're teaching him is, church is secondary. When you're down there with him, and I'm glad you're down there with him, and he's playing, and I'm glad he's down there playing, and I'm glad he's hitting, and I'm glad he's catching, and I'm glad he's doing all that, but all of his friends here are here. And they're wanting to know why he's down there, and, and, and now I'm wanting to know why he's down there. And so everybody's down there. Well, well they have games on Sunday down there. And that's what you got to do when you sign up for something on Sunday. Uh, two things you learn about Sunday is you got to prepare... That means Saturdays are something you are very careful about what you do, okay? Because you don't want to get in trouble and not be able to make Sunday. And uh, Sundays take planning, and it's the first day of the week, and that's how we start our week. Paul says, when you come together on the first day of the week. So it's good to be here with you all on the first day of the week so we can study a little bit together. Uh, turn in your Bibles, if you will. Uh, we'll start... We'll do a little bit of review, not much, but we're gonna, we've already covered the first two, and uh, we're going to go ahead and, and tackle the next two. I wanted to kind of explain that on these three right here, they're kind of one group, okay? So there are four points, but uh, the basis, the means, and the object are all very important that you get those and kind of as a group, and then the content of the message that's the last part of it, and that's, that's something that's variable and changes, so I set that apart. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. We'll begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. And Lord, we thank you for all the moms here today. We thank you for uh, the little ones, and we thank you for the fact that motherhood is extolled, and it is uh, held up here as something that's very holy and very important in the lives of believers. Uh, we thank you for moms here and all over the world today, and uh, we thank you for establishing marriage and, and the fruits of it. We thank you for it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I was saddened this week when I was listening to this stuff on uh, uh, Fox about the, uh, the, the young girls that were uh, found in, in the basement in Cleveland. And uh, th this, most of you know this is not some new thing that's happened this has happened many many times before and there are many movies about it there's I mean all kinds of films about this kind of stuff and torture is no new thing for men okay and women and uh, it makes me mad when they do this to children it makes me really mad and uh, I, I, my, my way of thinking is they can't kill that guy enough okay uh, I don't care if they give him the death sentence or not they can't do it enough but God's gonna do it enough trust me and uh, and more so but the, the idea of those young girls coming out of that situation with a little child and now evidence that there were other little children and you say where are they at now you know and it, you know it, it's just it's so horrific but I, I told my son I said you know it's it's kind of a good thing in this sense that people need to be face to face with just how wicked man is they, they need to see it because it's a reminder, because people want to think that people are so good and up with people, and, and man is basically good. How many of you have heard that phrase? And that man is okay and so forth. No, man is not basically good. This is the reason Christ had to come and die for our sins and justify us from all things and to be able to get us in a position to spend eternity with him. And uh, there's been a little bit of confusion over the years uh, uh, among Bible believers and, and people who study these things through about how people are justified in time past, how people are justified today, and how people are justified in the future. So you would think that most people today as believers would understand how people are justified today. The gospel, the grace of God, and how people are saved seems to be very clear here. In Christendom to not today, it's not clear. As a matter of fact, it's, uh, misunderstanding all this is a hindrance to, to evangelism. 
And so as you look at the precedents for it, you say, well, Israel messed it up. They didn't understand it for 1,500 years. And Satan was very successful with them in that. And now he's been very successful in the church, the body of Christ. And you're going to find out that he's going to be even successful in the kingdom. And he's going to be, we studied this Tuesday night, he, he's going to be bound in the bottomless pit. He's not even going to have an influence on the world. And while the kingdom's going on and he's in the bottomless pit and the Lord is ruling and reigning in the kingdom of heaven and the whole thing goes, when it's over, he lets him out of the bottomless pit and it just takes a little season, the Bible says. And after that little season, what happens? For some reason, all the believers are gathered around Jerusalem, and there's like they're going to encircle it, and they're going to take it back. Now, Satan's been there for a thousand years in this bottomless pit, and, and he lets, God lets him out for a short season, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, the saints in the kingdom of heaven are there in the city of the great king. The, the kingdom's been going on for a thousand years. It's, all, it's basically over. And what happens? The last and final rebellion in the entire universe occurs. And it happens by people who were born during this kingdom's process. They were born while it was going on, and they had a sin nature. You see what it says? That even with the devil in the bottomless pit, even with the Lord Jesus Christ on the throne, even with the earth brought back to a position of complete paradise, even with all these factors... The millennial kingdom really ends with a scene of great failure. And, and it's always been kind of strange to look at it, but, but really when you study the chart, you find that, that all dispensations end in failure. Now ours, it doesn't seem to end in failure for us, because we go up, right? You die where you sit today, you still go up. But if you're here when the rapture comes, you're going to go up. See, so well, how does that failure? Well, it's failure because the church, the body of Christ, has not reached the world. It's taken 2,000 years, okay, and, and they have done such a poor job of trying to reach the world that, that you, you realize, you say, well, they didn't do a very good job. That's failure. And you say, well, why does it fail over here? It fails over here because even with all those conditions and all that, that put in place, God demonstrates for the final time the same thing he demonstrated back here under the law, the same thing he demonstrated over here when he starts talking to Adam. Why? Why do you <laughs> hide behind that tree? Why are you hiding? Because there's failure. And there needs to be accountability. And God, in every program that he has, he brings people to accountability just Exactly when he's talking to Adam about why are you hiding behind the tree? Who told you you were naked? God knew all those things. He was trying to get him to, to come clean and become accountable. This makes everybody accountable. And at the end of this kingdom program, you know what happens? Complete and total failure. As soon as they gather around to try to bring about this rebellion, fire comes down from heaven and, and they're all gone. It's very quick. And that is really the last rebellion in the universe. That's the very last rebellion, and, and he starts by burning them up. He takes the kingdom of heaven, and he transports it to another place, and he burns up the heaven and the earth that we now know. And then he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. That's Revelation 21, 22, and he's going to start all over again, and there'll be no more rebellion at that point ever again. And that's the total victory that we see in first, at the end of 1 Corinthians 15. And you see how that, that this all begins, this whole thing that we've been talking about, it all begins with people and how they get justified before God, how they have the understanding of being saved and their salvation. And all this comes by faith the object of their faith and what they're supposed to believe and, and the content of their message and what it is they're supposed to believe. I, I've talked to people, you know, what is it that you think you need to believe? Well, sometimes they're a little confused. Turn back to the book of Job. Let's start there, I guess. That'd be a good place to start today.
there are some questions in the book of Job that are fantastic. And uh, go to Job chapter 25. And uh, one of Job's friends, one of the many friends that he has trying to help him out here, and they're having these discussions about Job's sin and, and, and how a person can be just and so forth. The, the overall overarching theme of the book of Job is why do the righteous suffer? And uh, we kind of asked that question this week. Why do the children have to suffer? Why do the people that are innocent, more innocent, have to suffer? Why do they do this? Because men are bad. That's why. And uh, it's the way it is. And they suffer under the curse of sin and the results of it. Look at Job chapter 25. And, Job, and, and when you see this in Job chapter 25, Bildad, this is his, his third time speaking. And you can see he's lost. He doesn't know the Lord. He's a religionist. And you read his other, his other uh, discussions here, and you can see that he's a religionist. But look what he says. In verse 1, Job 25, verse 1, Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? And then he asked this question. People talk about God all the time and have no idea who he really is. He says, How then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? He says in another place, can a clean thing come from an unclean thing? How is that possible? How then can a man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm makes you kind of recognize just how far a worm can go in Cleveland, okay? He says, and the son of man, which is a worm. You see, there's none righteous, as Paul says. No, not one. And yet we talk about our justification and our righteousness as such a matter of fact that people sometimes get a little confused. Turn over to the book of Galatians. Let me show you a verse over here. There's kind of come a day. that you're going to not only see God face to face, eye to eye, you're going to spend time with him in such a way that, that you'll never be out of his reach. You'll never be out of his fellowship. You'll never be out or away from him ever again. Paul says, you know, when we're in the body, we're absent from the Lord, and we're absent from the body, we're with the Lord. So there is this distinction. Now, the Lord lives in us, yes, but we only know him in a spiritual sense. We only know him by faith. We don't look at him. We don't feel him. We don't touch him. Empirically, that's just not happening yet. Everything we believe, we believe and trust by God's word. And he says in verse 5, Paul's talking about the idea of, of not living your life under the yoke of bondage of the law. And he says, for we through the Spirit, verse 5, 5, 5, I'm in Galatians 5. He says, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. And, you know, I read that passage and I said, wait a minute. I'm not waiting for the hope of righteousness. I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that I've been made the righteousness of God in him. So if I'm made the righteousness of God and I have the righteousness of God, why am I hoping for something like this? And in verse 5, the reason he says it this way and what he's actually talking about is this. In the context of this, people are trying to get you to live under a life of bondage and religion and, and, and do's and don'ts and, you know, all of that sort of thing. 
And he says in verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, what happens to you when you try to live your life being justified by the law of Moses? You fall from the high and lofty place of grace down to the weak and beggarly elements of the law, into religion, into the pit of it. But Paul says in verse 5, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. You see, there's going to come a day when you're not going to have any sin at all in your mind. There's going to come a day when you're not going to have any sin in your body. There's going to come a time when you're not going to have any sin in the, in the space that you live all the way around you. There won't be any news come in over the TV about what happened in Cleveland or what happens in Colorado or what happens in L.A. or what happens in New York City because there won't be any unrighteousness in heaven. You're going to be sinless in every aspect of your being. Now, that's not a reality for you today. You're, you're dealing with a life right now that's got two natures. You've got your old nature, which ju just about does anything it jolly well wants whenever it wants to do it. And you have a new nature, which as it grows, it begins to tame that old one and, and recognizes it to be dead and therefore ignores it. And every time there's that situation that comes up in your life where you say, well, I, 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 I don't know what I should do about this. I want to do this, but then I shouldn't. Well, yeah, you shouldn't even be thinking about it. But at the same time, you realize that some of the things you do wrong have more thinking time behind it. You know what I mean? In other words, some of the things you do wrong, you think about it more before you say, I don't want to do that. Or you think about it more, and then you decide, oh, I do want to do it, and you do it. And then there are some times that you're actually going to plan those things out and make provision to do it. It's like, oh. I keep telling myself when I go to the grocery store that if you don't buy it, you can't eat it. Isn't that right? That's the way to do it. You put it in the cart, it's your own fault. Okay? <laughs> if you buy it, and of course, you know, when you buy food, you've got to justify yourself to eat it because you paid for it. You don't want to throw food away. So what are you going to do with that ice cream? You bought it, you go, I don't really shouldn't be having that. Well, what are you going to do with it? I'm going to get rid of it. Right. How are you going to get rid of it? You're going to eat it. So that, that in your own small way, you're planning and plotting and, and doing the things that you want to do, and at the same time, the whole time you're doing it, you know better. So you listen to one side, and you listen to the other, and you, you make these decisions. And when it looks like it's harmless enough, you'll go ahead and do it. Well, there's going to come a day when you don't have to do any of that. Your life will not be lived that way. Your life, you'll be, you'll be living a life that is so delivered from the presence of sin that you could search for eternity and never find it. Because you're not going to be able to go where it exists. That's why if there's one person in heaven with one sin, it's going to make a hell out of that place, and you wouldn't want to be there. One boaster is all it takes. One guy telling you for eternity how great he was. No. Paul says, where is boasting then? It's excluded. So as you go down through these points, I want you to remember that this one here, the basis of justification right here, is always the blood of Jesus Christ and never anything else. It was the blood of Jesus Christ for Adam. It's the blood of Jesus Christ for the last person that gets saved in this kingdom over here. It's always the blood of Jesus Christ. It can never be anything else because without it, if you have people just without that, then there would have been a way that they could be justified without the blood of Christ. And if that's the case, then Christ died for nothing. Look at Galatians chapter 2. Just turn back a little ways there. Notice what he says. And boy, this is really what, what I'm talking about right now, about you doing these things this way and that way. This is frustration for people. Because once they do it, and then they go, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. That's frustrating. Uh, well, we're all sorry for sin, but after the fact, it doesn't really cut it. Look at verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. 
Well, explain to me how you don't frustrate the grace of God. He says, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Okay, so if righteousness come by the law, then Jesus Christ died for nothing. Why, why not just eliminate this, take it off the chart, and let's just all keep the law? I mean, if, if one person can do it, should we not all be able to do it? But when he says over there in Romans 3, there's none righteous, no, not one, that's what he meant. There isn't anybody that's ever done that. So you see, when he says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness has come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. The context here is that if you're going to live your life with the old man sitting next to you all the time, it's going to be a problem. And that failure is really not necessary. If you, if you say, get out, of, get out of here <laughs> and get back in your box and leave him in the coffin where he belongs, then he won't bother you. And, and I'm going to tell you, it's when he's sitting next to you that he bothers you the most. So as you begin to study this, and you go through it, you realize, hey, the blood of Jesus Christ has saved me from the penalty of sin. I'm not going to hell. It saves me from the power of sin. I don't have to sin. It's, future, it's, it's in the future going to save me from the presence of sin. I'm never going to see it. So that's the basis, and it's never going to change. Now, the means of justification and salvation have to do with how it applies in your life. What is the means by which you obtain it? The means by which you obtain it is always, always, always too, always faith alone and no other way. And it's always been that way. Adam, to the end of time, every person that came from Adam has to make a choice. Now, Adam made a choice, didn't he? But it was the wrong one. And he sinned. In the day that he ate, he died spiritually. The part of him, the part of him that was communicating with God was cut off. It was, it was dead. This is why he tries to hide from him, and God searches him out and talks to him. And I don't believe they communicated that way before. I believe that, was, that he was just like it is with us in prayer. And we, we, they had communion. That was cut off. And so Adam and Eve have to get saved. Somebody asked me one time, did Adam and Eve get saved? I said, well... I hope so. But I didn't know. I thought, well, that's a good question. You know, I don't really know. Well, I started studying it out. Of course they got saved. And how do you know they got saved? Well, you've got to kind of look at the context of what God does. But what does he do for them? Does he do something for them after they get saved? Because they're over there pathetically sewing those fig leaves together, trying to cover themselves up, and, and they've lost the glory of God hanging around their bodies. That, that Now they know they're naked, and they're over there hiding. And... you find out that, that Eve believed exactly what Satan believed. There's a correlation between, between what Satan thinks and what Eve begins to think. And you know where she learned how to think like that? From Satan. He wanted something that he shouldn't have wanted, and she wanted something she shouldn't have wanted. The thing about my, around my house is you want too much. That's a standard line in my vocabulary. It comes out constantly. You want too much. Because kids always want. Everybody wants, you know. And, and so Eve wants something. She wants to be somebody that she's not. She wants to gain something that she thinks she doesn't have. Isn't that what happens when you go through the the line at the grocery store and you see all those these magazines with all these these gods and who are these gods well they call them stars in hollywood but they're gods to the people to the peons they're gods <laughs> and their lives are a wreck <laughs> But they want to know what they're doing and who they're sleeping with and how much money they got and how much they just made on this picture and all this stuff. And we look at that and we go, I want that. I want, I want all that. 
And people want to be that way. They want to have their signature. Just give me your signature. Can I have your autograph? Well, I just want to go by their house and look at where they live. And I just want to see pictures of them. That's why they sell all these magazines. And it's like they want to be something they're not. Well, Adam and Eve wanted to be something they're not either. I mean, they, they weren't. It's the same thing. But what does God do? He brings the shed blood of the innocent animal forth to look forward to Calvary. Now, in the garden, up until that time, Adam had been naming the animals, not killing them. And now God has killed an animal that did not have a sin nature. When you kill an innocent animal, you're killing a creature that never sinned in word, thought, or deed. Animals do not sin. They act like it sometimes because we're kind of programmed to think that they're sinning when we don't do what they, we tell them to do. <laughs> but that's not the case, and you know it. They don't have a sin nature. And so God, he, he, he kills those animals, and he sheds that innocent blood, and he brings the covering for them, and he covers them up. And the reason you don't have a big dissertation about Adam and Eve and them coming out and believing God finally and we didn't mean to do that and we, now we believe is because that's confusing. They're never held up as pictures of faith in your Bible. They're, they're held up as pictures of unbelief. That's their life's example for us. And then after that occurs, then the big battle that we're talking about here comes up between Cain and Abel. Because Cain didn't buy any of this, and Abel did. And Abel's out there doing the right thing, and he's bringing the blood, and Cain's going, that's unnecessary. I've done all this right here. He'll take that. And God didn't take it. And, of course, you see the, the problem. So the thing progresses. And as it progresses, you begin to see that over the, over the years and time past, people believed that they could do something with their faith in order to get the justification from God. They did not believe that the, the, the basis of justification was the blood of Christ because they didn't really understand everything about the blood of Christ. They didn't understand anything about it. Think about the 2,500 years before, before Moses ever wrote the first book of the New Test Old Testament. There was the book of Job we just read from. That was, that was written during the period where Israel was in Egypt. But then when they came out of Egypt, they got the book of Job. Then they add the five books of Moses to it. And then they all start collecting. But they're learning about these things as they, what? Progress. So they did not have a real clear understanding about what's happening here. As a matter of fact, the 12 apostles didn't even have a real clear understanding of what happened, what was going to happen. So it's pretty clear that in time past and today, which is all the reference we have, we, we can't deal with this yet, but all, where we are now and, and going all the way back, it is clear that there's only been one way to get to God. Now, the object of faith has always been God and his word, what he has said. It's never been anything else. So what you put your faith in and what it is you believe always has to do with what God has said at that time. That's where we get into the content. This is an interesting thing because some people want to mix this up. They want to make the object of faith something else. Look at Romans chapter 4. Now you say, well, where are we going to go to find this out? Well, this is it right here, Romans chapter 4. And we're going to show you in Acts chapter, or Romans chapter 4, verse... I wish I had a nickel for every time I've gone to Romans 4. We go there a lot, don't we? Romans chapter 4, here's what it says. What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it, his faith, his belief in God, and what God said to him, it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So God owes you the eternal life if you're going to work for it, and you know you can't work for it, so... 
what's the answer? Verse 5 is the answer, but to him that worketh not. So this is not about working. This is about ceasing from that. This is about just like a drowning man. Put your arms up and forget it. I'm drowning. What happens when a guy can't swim? Tries to swim, can't get anywhere, keeps going down. What do you do? Well, if there's people on the beach, he's going to start putting his hand up. That's kind of the universal sign, I'm going down. You see a hand going down, what does that mean? That guy's drowning. There comes a time where you just quit swimming and say, I'm going down, just help me. Now, if I went out there with a boat and rode out there with a boat, I'd gotten a little boat, went out there and tried to save you, I wouldn't come up about 20 feet from you and say, oh, come on, you can do it. Come on, come on. When we used to do the mile swim in scouts, we we practice that thing in a lake. And we go up and back, up and back, up and back. It was a mile. That's a long ways. And it's a long ways to walk a mile, okay, much less swim a mile. But we'd always do it with somebody in a boat next to us, rowing, with a life jacket and or with a you know life raft and a rope and all that, all that stuff was there, and we'd be swimming. And if if they were really young and small, sometimes they wanted to try to do this, we'd swim with them. Those who have done the mile swim, they swim along with them. But we generally make them feel like the, you know that the idea was okay, go and do this by yourself, okay? <laughs> and uh, they get out there and they, they get tired, they go up and back, and they're tired. It's like oh man, <laughs> you know. Well, remember this could be rough water. This is a lake. You got it easy, okay? So if you're tired, then slow down and rest a little bit. Float on your back, okay? We don't care how you get there, but you got to get there, all right? The goal is to get somebody that can swim a mile or swim a half mile and another half mile and get back to, to the land with somebody with them. I remember they used to make us jump in, and, and you, gotta, you got fully dressed. you got to get all your clothes off down to your skivvies. you got to do all that underwater. You got to jump in the water without losing sight of the victim. I saw a guy on TV last night. He jumped 40 feet from a tower into 12 inches of water, and does it all the time. Big pool, look like it looked like a kiddie pool, but a pretty good size one. Had a foot of water in that thing, and he constantly jumps from 40 feet and lands right on his belly with his hands out and his head straight up like that, and he never hits the bottom of the pool. Amazing, okay. So when you go into the water, how do you go in? You go in in such a way that you don't take your eyes off the victim, and there's a way that you go into the water that you don't go under. All of these are preparations, and all of these are things that you learn when you're trying to save somebody. You don't go out to save them and say, come on, you can do it. It's clear when you go out there that they can't do it. So you're trying to save them. That's what a savior does. And he saves you. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the what? Verse 5 says, he justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. He believes God. Okay? That's the idea. Look at verse 17. Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even what? God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Abraham did what? Look at verse 3 again. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. It will not do you any good to believe God if you're trying to believe what God said to someone else instead of what he said to you. In our case, it's over here through Paul, back here. It's more than one place. It's not just here or here or whatever. It's, it changes because it's, it's progressive. What did he actually tell Abraham? Turn over to Galatians 3. What did he actually tell Abraham to believe? What was the gospel to Abraham? I was reading a book with this guy. He was talking about this issue and. Uh, he said, oh, Abraham knew the gospel. <laughs> uh, dude, listen, he, he didn't know the gospel, the grace of God. It wasn't revealed to him. What Abraham believed back here when God spoke to him was very specific. Read Abraham's account of it. You can go to Genesis chapter 12. You can read the whole thing. But here's what Paul says about it. 
Here's some divine commentary on it. Uh, after the fact, in the context of you learning the gospel. And so here's what Paul says. Verse 6. Uh, he says, even as Abraham believed God. There it is again. You see verse 6? 3, 6. Now in the context of chapter 3, Paul is trying to tell these Galatians, you can't get saved by the Holy Spirit getting into you. You can't get saved by faith without any works at all, and then begin to live your life in the flesh. It won't work. That's what he's going to tell you in chapter 5 when he gets over there where we just came from about standing fast and don't let people put you under that yoke of bondage. So when he starts out chapter 3, look what he says. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath evidently set forth been evidently set forth, crucified among you. You've believed Jesus Christ crucified. You've believed the message of Christ crucified. This only would I learn of you. Now here's the question. This is a scathing question. He says, receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Is that when you got saved? When you got done doing, 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 doing? Or did you get saved by believing the gospel? See, they got saved by believing the gospel, and somebody else comes in and puts them under legalism. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's a satanic tactic. That's why it's happening today as well. But it was happening in Paul's ministry in the early parts of the days of the body of Christ, and it's still happening today. Look at verse 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect in the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He, therefore, that ministers to you uh, the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The person that did all this for you, me, okay, <laughs> that's what he's talking about. Did, did I do it by the works of the law? Did I come in here peddling the idea of the law? Uh, we'll read Jason's favorite verse. Look over at chapter 3. We were talking about this this morning. Uh, look at chapter 3, verse 21. Now start with me in verse 19. He says, Wherefore then serveth the law? What's the purpose of it? It was added because of the transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. That's Moses. He says, Now a mediator is not a mediator of one. You've got to have two people to mediate. You don't mediate between one person. Right? You mediate between two people. They're the ones having the argument. And he says, but God doesn't, God is one. Okay? He says, he says, now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. Now notice what he says, verse 21. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, if there could have been one that was given, that could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. See, it's just not possible. So when it comes down to understanding the object of your faith and what you're to believe, it's always God. It can't be anything else. And in his word, and then we should also add to that that it's going to be in his word what? Rightly divided. Because Satan comes along and says, yeah, you can believe God, no problem. You can believe his word, no problem. Just as long as you believe somebody else's male instead of yours, and you run over here and start believing something else. Now here's the problem. We have a 1,500-year history of Israel trying to keep the law to get justified. They're trying to take faith and works and add them together and make this, this mongrel mess, this, this, this mess that you, that, that you try to bring your works into it, and they miss the point. You'll say, well, that did a great job in proving that man needs a redeemer. Yes, but it also left a pattern for people to go back to as a standard or a bad example. And so they, see there? See what Israel's doing? That's how you're supposed to do it, just like they did it. I said, no, you don't, you don't get it. Israel did it wrong. You don't follow the bad example. You follow the good example. You see, there were people 
that lived back here that understood the right way, but they were so few and far between. Can I tell you today that most of Israel in the Old Testament was lost and went to hell? We think about the Gentiles going to hell during that period. What happened to the Gentiles since the Tower of Babel? All during that law period, where were they? They were dying and going to hell. Because Israel wasn't believing it themselves, much less taking it out to the Gentiles so they could get it. They weren't even believing it themselves. Wow. So where does this thing end? It culminates in a person right here. There he is. I thought it was very interesting. Somebody mentioned... Paul's mother, and being Mother's Day, we might want to take a look at this verse. Look over at Romans chapter 16. You say, well, was Paul's parents saved? I doubt it. Because if they were, he would have probably been saved. I mean, in the midst of Judaism. I mean, you can still get saved in Judaism under that program, no doubt. You think... Uh, Joseph and Mary were saved people? Absolutely. What about John's parents? You think that, that uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth were, were saved people? Absolutely they were. So under that program, you could still have people that were believers in your family, especially your parents, whatever. So, so if Paul's parents were saved, why didn't he get it? More than likely they weren't. My dad used to say, you know, he, he would always say, it's a known fact that if your parents don't have any children, you won't either. Well, if your parents aren't saved, you probably aren't either. You know why? Because most parents give their kids the gospel. <laughs> so it's a sad thing when, when, when family gets saved, you know, kids get saved, and they've got to go back and give their parents the gospel. Well, it happens all the time. So what does Paul mean here in verse 13 of Romans 16? Romans 16, 13, he says, Salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. I always had a trouble. I always had trouble with that verse. I said, "Was his mom saved?" You think? I don't think she was. I don't think there's any indication that she ever was. As a matter of fact, I don't think his parents were saved, and I don't think Gamaliel was saved, the man who was teaching him. Because if he'd have been saved, Paul probably would have gotten saved too. Paul had a bunch of people in his life that were lost, and that's why he was lost. So what's the deal here with the mother? Well, that's Rufus's mother. Well, what's Paul, what, what's Paul saying? Is he just saying hi to Rufus's mother? But he calls her his also. He says it's Rufus, his mother, and mine. So I always thought, well, maybe it's talking about Rufus's mother and my mother. Maybe they know each other. Good possibility. Here's another possibility. Never even thought about this, but it came to light. I was reading something, and I thought, wow, that's a good point. If his parents forsook him after what happened to him, because he was a young man when he got saved, so they must have not have been, I mean, more than likely they were still alive, right? Once he gets saved, what are they going to do? He, fors he forsakes everything, all the education they were sending him down there for in Jerusalem, all that, that that's, we're all done. What do they do? What do most Jews do today when their children get saved and, and become Christians? They cut them off. They have funerals for them. They completely cut them off. They, they are completely cut out. They're no longer, they're, they're dead to me, that thinking. I think Paul had a mother here that loved him, took care of him, and he considered his own. Rufus's mother. That's why he says hi. When John is standing at the foot of the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ, one of those seven sayings of his on the cross, those seven things that Christ said, one of them is this, Behold thy mother. Why would he call his mother John's mother now? To John, he says, behold, thy mother. Well, I'm not going to be here to take care of her, John. And John's the youngest of all those guys. So who's going to take care of mom? You. Behold, thy mother. So there's Paul's Mother's Day greeting right there. Probably Rufus's mom. Treat, treated him like a son, took care. I'm sure a lot of ladies did uh, when he was young like that, when he got saved, because he needed it. Everybody needs a mother, okay? And it, mom never quits being mom, no matter how old you get. I'm 55, my mom's still mom to me, just like yours is, you know. And those of you who have lost your mothers already and they've gone to be with the Lord, you know, you know, it's a precious thing to have a mom, and it's worse to lose one. 
it's a hard thing. Now, in all this, we learn that if you're going to believe God's word and what God says about it, you need to be careful what you read. Now, the content of that message is going to change. Look over at Galatians chapter 3, and let's take a look at the actual message that Abraham believed. And, and it's funny because I shouldn't really actually say it that way because we don't really get all the details here, but we got enough of it. But we'll, we'll go down through here. And after he gets done with that scathing five sentences in, <laughs> in chapter 3 about them being foolish, and even though in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John you're not supposed to call somebody a fool, he definitely does it here, doesn't he? Well, he had a cause, and this is God the Holy Spirit saying it, so we'll, we'll leave it there. But look at verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now, you keep seeing this verse show up, right? Look at verse 7. This is Genesis 15, 6 is where that, where that comes from. And he says, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So you have a kinship to Abraham that you don't really have a, any kind of genetic connection to him other than through Adam, you do. But you don't have, you're not really able to demonstrate through genealogy that you're Jewish or Hebrew or anything else. You couldn't do it if you wanted to. You can try it, but... You can't go back. Uh, this whole idea here is really going to start coming together in verse 8. But he's trying to get them to understand about faith. And in verse 8 he says, And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham. Well, why did he do it that way? Because he knows that in the Abrahamic covenant, when he says that in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, it's going to be done by a message that's rooted and grounded in the faith in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because over here, everybody is believing in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can get in today. We, we, we shout that from the housetops. And over here, it's also going to be the message right here in the kingdom. This is all going to be attached to it. And you know what happens when you get the gospel of the kingdom over here progressed far enough to where it now understands and adapts to the idea of the cross and the shed blood of cross, and now they begin to understand a little bit more about the cross and the shed blood, what happens to that? It becomes good news for all the what? Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Well, I could go to a lot of other verses, but we run out of time, so we'll just hit the high ones, the, the high points. Uh, Revelation chapter 1. And... Uh, Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, notice what it says. L look at this. This is beautiful. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now he says that to the nation of Israel in the middle of of the tribulation period. That's where this book is going to come about and get it and come into its own. And the Lord Jesus Christ here is cl it's clearly understood by John that it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes them from all their sins. Peter goes into the whole thing. Everything from Hebrews to Revelation, you begin to see the blood of Christ added to this message of the gospel of the kingdom. Before, it's not there. That Before, it's you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the King of Israel. That was enough to get you saved. Now when this blood issue comes in after Paul, he gets it. Now he gives it to the 12 apostles. They begin to understand it. And over here, now we, now we learn that the apostles learned from Paul how that fit into their message and to their program. They didn't understand that. Oh. So I guess you might say that Paul's first really good Students in this area were the apostles themselves because they learned how the blood of Christ worked to their advantage. You see, without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no need for any of this. This all comes down to it being through the blood of Jesus Christ all the way through. Now, when you start looking at programs that have works attached to that, like the law of Moses is attached to the promise, you have to be careful because... 
the law of Moses there, turn over to Galatians chapter 3. The, the, the law of Moses was added to that promise program to, to do something that needed to be done. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and look at verse 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, that's the covenant of the law, the law of Moses, which was 430 years after, this is after the Abrahamic covenant, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. Nothing that you add in the way of an addendum to this promise is going to undo the fact that this thing must come by promise, not by works. It's by faith in a promise. What does the promise bring? Look at chapter 3, verse 13. No, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 10. Because here you see the possibility of getting it by any other way. He says, For as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident for, he says, the just shall live by faith. That's the second time Paul has quoted that. And then he says in verse 12, the law and the law is not of faith. Now what does he mean by that? And the law is not of faith. It means... Exactly what it says at the re in the rest of the verse. He says, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. In other words, it's a do or die thing. This is not a, a do or not die thing. This is a do or die thing. In other words, the law is not just something you believe you have to do. It's not the ten suggestions. It's the law of Moses. All that thou hast said, we will do. That's what they said in Exodus 19. All that thou hast said, we will do. God says, okay, fine. If you don't do it, you're going to die. If you don't do it, you're going to lose the blessing. If you don't do it, you're going to get punished. If you don't do it, I'm going to, I'm going to put this on your back so hard that it's going to bring sin to the surface, and it's going to show you exactly what you are. And when you say all that thou hast said, we will do, you just bit off way more than you can chew. They should have said, we can't do that. But they didn't. And notice what he says. It's not a faith, by the way. The law is not about faith. It is about you believing God by faith. And if you believe God by faith, you'd say, God, you said I'm a sinner. I can't do it. I believe that. So what's going to happen? Well, here's verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham, now here's verse 14, now get this close. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. What is the promise of the Spirit? It's, it's eternal life is what it is. So the promise cannot be disannulled by the law. Now go back to verse 17. For this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise, and I don't care what you do. You can add the law of Moses to it. You can add uh, anything else you want to try to add to it. But God says that it's all going to be done by promise, and that's how the world's going to get saved in the kingdom. That's how the world's getting saved today. And, and now Paul's teaching just, well, that's how they got saved back here. It's always been that way. That's the good news to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going, we can't, we can't do what they do because we don't even have a contract with God. Paul says, you don't need it. They didn't keep it either. Do you understand what he, what he says when he's concluded them all in unbelief? That this whole thing right here was not something that Israel just failed to do. It was never, ever given to them to do what they were trying to do. Go back to Galatians 1 and we'll stop. It's time to close. We've hit the hour mark, so. 
Look at Galatians 1 and verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that call you, called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. These people had gotten saved. Notice what he says in verse 4. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Paul goes on, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel. Well, who called him into the grace of Christ? He did. Paul did. And he says, I marvel that you've, you've, you're, you've already left this. He says, but it's unto another gospel. Well, what is it that they're believing now? Verse 7, which is not another. That tells me right there that it's not a bona fide gospel message that came from God anywhere on this chart. It doesn't belong anywhere on this chart. The equation should go like this. Um, I'll just get rid of this because we're done with it. The, the equation would look like this. Faith plus works always equals works. You see anybody pleading their works? They're not, they're not understanding what that is right there. This never pleads that. You start adding faith and works together, and what happens? You're indicating that you don't really believe it. That's why Romans 4 says to him that worketh not, cease from it. Throw up your hands and just admit it. You're drowning, okay? That's the idea. So now he says, about this gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So adding works to it is a perversion. And then he warns them about believing it twice, that they're going to be cursed if they do believe it. And this is where it goes. Galatianism is not just trying to bring works into the Christian life. It is also about people going around trying to demonstrate through the gospel message that faith and works go together. That was the issue in, in Acts 15, and the issue in Acts 15 had nothing to do with works as something a Christian would do. They said if you don't get circumcised, you cannot be saved. It wasn't about the grace life. That's the second part of the book of Galatians. That's what we were just looking at a while ago. You can't start this way and then end up this way. You can't add works to your Christian life because it'll just make you a legalist. This is why there's so much failure in Christendom today in the body of Christ. It's because they're adding works to it. But think about this. There are far more people that aren't even getting into the body of Christ because somebody's coming along preaching to them that faith and works is the message. That is what makes up 99% of Christendom. You say, we talk about the grace life here. Yeah, but you know, our, our audience to the grace life is really small compared to our audience to the lost, isn't it? Because the real problem we're battling here is that even people that are in Christianity, that are in churchianity, that profess to be Christians, that say they believe the gospel, are out there preaching a wrong gospel. It's a mongrel gospel. It's not another bona fide gospel. And this all comes from this misunderstanding of the object of the person's faith. And also it comes from taking this progression of messages back here in other dispensations that they were supposed to believe that and trying to take that and put that on them. Noah didn't get saved by building an ark. Noah got saved by believing God's word. Then he built the ark. Abraham didn't offer his son on Mount Moriah because he was trying to get saved. He offered his son so that, because he already was saved. That's what made him do it. That was a demonstration of faith to the ultimate level in which he became the friend of God. That was the goal in, the, in that believer's life. Is your goal today to become the friend of God? Turn over to James chapter 2. Everybody wants to run to James 2 because they believe they can prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that working will get you justified. 
This, is, this book isn't about getting justified by works. This, this book is about demonstrating your righteousness, which is a form of justification, by your works. You're going to demonstrate by works that you're already justified. That's what this book's about. That's what James chapter 2 is about. And if you don't believe that, start out in chapter 2, verse 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Once you're guilty of all, what makes you think you can continue on in doing good works? Once you hit the one guilty, how many guilties you got? Do anybody have a number? <laughs> you don't want to know that number. Well, I can tell you it's bigger than any calculator I got, okay, for me. It just goes on and on and on. Do you ever calculate numbers that are so big you can't get them on the calculator? I tried doing that with 10,000 times 10,000, and my I had to reset the decimal point. I couldn't get it. Once you hit one guilty, that's your first one, by the way. After you become accountable, like he tried to get Adam to become accountable, well, he did. Well, once you, the first time you were ever accountable, the first sin in your life, the first time you ever believed that this was wrong and you knew it was wrong and you did it anyway, you sinned. That first guilty on you just made you guilty of all ten of the Ten Commandments. And from that point on, it's a moot point in your life to try to say, I can demonstrate by faith and works, and that's how I get saved. Now, once you're out, you're out. Right? I mean, do you ever change your mind when you go skydiving? When's the best time to do that? Well, before you get in the plane, or while you're still in the plane, it's fine. But when you jump out, is it, is it okay to change your mind? It's a little late then, isn't it? So, these things are difficult for some folks. But I'm going to tell you, the basic principle that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, and that no flesh could be justified in his sight by the law of Moses demonstrates clearly and easily throughout the entire word of God that there is nothing that any son of Adam could ever do in word, thought, or deed that would allow them to get be made just before God. Bildad demonstrates himself to be lost. Job demonstrates himself to be just. Although he had sin in his life, and he had suffering. God was letting Satan whoop him good, okay, spanking him hard. He did not curse God. Interestingly enough, in that book, when his wife tells him, why don't you curse God and die at the end of the book of Job when he gets all of his children back and all of his cattle back and all of his camels back and all of his, everybody back, he doesn't get his wife back. She's never returned to him. There's, no, there's nothing in the book of Job of him ever getting his wife restored unto him. You see, he had problems. I think he found out that his wife was an unbeliever. He, he realized it. What a sad thing. What a deal. Well, when it comes right down to it, you know what? The content of the message might change. Okay, and you have to know how those changes take place. That helps to know right division. But the real issue is you're going to believe God and in, in, in his word on what it is you need to believe in order to get saved, and then you can start believing him for everything else because if you believe him for that, why would you ever doubt him on anything else after that? Right? That makes sense to me. Okay, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that there are many, many views out there of what people think and about what they think and, and, and deal with on this particular issue, but we hope that the scriptures are clear to them that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but it's by your mercy that we get saved and that we've been put into the body of Christ by faith in your Son and in his blood. We thank you for it today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay, you all have a good Mother's Day. We'll see you next.